How's it going? This is James from James Films, back again with another video breaking down a specific technique that will really help you improve the depth in your renders. Adding depth to your render is really key for photorealism to give some believability to your scene. Your scenes can often look really flat and kind of lacking in character if they're just kind of one-dimensional. You know, they don't have a lot of you know, aspects or details kind of guiding the viewer's eye through the frame of your render. Recently, I've been working a lot on these animated versions of my renders, and one big reason I'm able to do these is because from the start, when I'm actually making just a still image, I'm thinking quite a bit of about the composition of my work, how your eye is going to be moved through the frame, and literally how the camera is going to be moving through the frame, as if you know you were a person walking along through this scene. I'm trying to get a little bit closer to creating my scenes in virtual reality in 360, and this is kind of a first step for me to be uh, moving towards that goal of creating something like that. So I'll walk you through some of the techniques that I use when I'm creating these kinds of pieces and hope that these kind of inspire you when you're working on your own renders. So the first tip I have is to actually look at references. So both real world references, but also paintings and artwork. I'm always really inspired by the work of the Hudson River School and I always have been for just a lot of my artistic journey. If I'm ever stuck, I'll often look back at a lot of the paintings that they put together because they capture a very cool realism for a lot of the work that they do. You know, back in the 1800s, there's this gorgeous uh, observation of nature and kind of the, the natural, untouched world here. You can see just beautiful canyons, beautiful mountains, rivers uh, with very little human presence. So I always kind of like to see, you know, what the world was like back then, you know, a couple hundred years ago, but also just how these painters saw the world around them and how they kind of thought about composition. And you can see there's a very clear foreground, middle ground, and background for all of these works. You know, in this one, you can see there's a couple people and animals and tents and stuff kind of set up in the front here. In the midground, you've got this kind of waterfall with some, you know, mountains and valleys kind of coming in here. And then way on the background is kind of more faded out. Uh, you know, you've got some atmospheric fall off going on. You've got these mountains in the beautiful blue sky. You know, a similar theme for a lot of these. And if we look at some ones that are kind of more contained scenes, even here where you've kind of have this forest scene, a little bit smaller scale, obviously, than that huge mountainous scene, the trout pool here. You can still see that that foreground, you've got these logs and kind of branches and things here. Middle ground, you've got this kind of where the focal point of your render, or of the art, or the painting is rather, is this little pool here of water which is being lit by the light. And then off in the distance, you know, this is, I guess, can be, can be considered the background. You've got some trees and a little hint of sky up there. So just a very common theme for a lot of these works is, is that, you know, kind of um, blocking of the foreground, middle ground, and background, very, very clearly defined, um, and kind of how the frame is set up here too. It kind of guides your eye naturally throughout. Um, I'm looking at a lot of these vertical ones because that is mainly what I create, is vertical type renders. So I kind of want your eye to kind of meander through the render as if you're kind of walking into the scene. If we were to look at some real world examples, so one place that I spent a lot of time was Princeton University, walking a lot of these corridors where I always loved kind of how it looks as you're approaching it. So you've got these beautiful archways framed by a lot of natural elements, a lot of plants and, and growth here with a lot of the built environment. You've got these stone buildings here, really cool archways as you kind of walk through. That's a puzzle apparently. Um, but you can see here, it kind of frames naturally. And for this one too, we've got the very clear foreground, a very clear you know, um, stone floor here frame of the archway, uh, the middle ground here, obviously, which is where the focal point is. And then in the background, you've got, you know, some trees and, and the building here. So even in the natural world, when you're walking around through places, you kind of will compartmentalize what you're seeing in your surroundings that way. So if we were to actually go over into Blender here, this is a scene I put together recently, uh, which you can see the animation for right now. It's this kind of interstellar hotel, I'm calling it. Uh, and so for this scene, I spent a lot of time blocking out the scene. I modeled this building from scratch here, which you can actually download over on my Patreon page, uh, get this building. It's a lot of fun to play around with. I spent a, quite a bit of time kind of making some of these little details, like these kind of little you know, curved archways and this little kind of dome feature here that's open air. I was kind of inspired by planetariums and wanted this kind of observatory feel to it. But I spent a lot of time blocking out the composition. And actually, when I initially started putting this together, I was just focusing on the building itself. So what you're seeing here in the background and this flooring. And I actually added in these staircases and this kind of central staircase here closer to the end. And this kind of brings me to a, a point about blocking out your scene. Don't feel like you are married to the very first composition that you define. So when you're initially starting to put things together, just working on very macro details, 
don't feel like you you have to stick to that exact look. You know, what I'm doing is in addition to tweaking, you know, a million other different things like lighting and, you know, uh, scene elements and different things, I'm also actually tweaking the macro details sometimes. Like I'm adding in new elements. Maybe I decide, hey, these windows would be cool to have. Let me just throw a boolean here, cut these windows out, which is something I actually did as I was working through, you know, adding in the staircase and actually adding in this kind of little frame here with a lot of bougainvillea and roses and stuff as you're kind of walking in. Um, so, you know, don't feel, don't be afraid to add details in as you're going through. Obviously focus initially on setting just what you're gonna be creating in the first place, blocking out the general details, but definitely go back in and as you see fit, be adding these things in. And one thing that helps me as I'm designing this and kind of brings me to point three is using a, a miss pass both for when you're actually rendering your scene out, but also while you're working in the viewport. This can really help you, you know, kind of understand what is going on in your scene if you're kind of getting bogged down in all the details and things here, if you're looking at just the viewport render. And so to enable that, you can actually go over to uh, this view layer properties here, scroll up to here, and then you can hit uh, mist in the data passes here. You can actually control the uh, fall off of that mist if you go over to your camera settings, um, or actually, sorry, in your world settings, there's a, a mist pass, and you can see the start distance is five meters, uh, 25 meters away. And what I meant to do over in this camera thing is if you go to your um, viewport display, show mist. This will now give you this little bar here that shows you where that distance is. So five meters away from the camera is the starting point of the mist. It's right there. The end point is 25 meters. And you can see that does not uh, include our whole scene. I want this to extend just beyond to these rocks here. So if I go back over to the world, I'll kick this way back here so it's ending a little bit further off. And so then if I go over to my rendered view, this might take a second to load up here. I can actually enable the mist pass and this will allow me to kind of see uh, specifically the kind of black and white details of my scene where things are kind of falling off. So this is the rendered view. Um, and if I go over to this drop down here to shading, right now I'm rendering a combined pass that you're seeing here. But if I click this drop down, I can actually go over to the data properties here and then click on show the mist render pass. And so now this shows me kind of general details, just overall details of my scene. If I kind of pull this maybe back just a little bit more and I can kind of adjust with this here just to kind of see where the general elements of the scene are, kind of where your viewer eye, viewer's eyes can be drawn just purely based on overall details. I, I will often render out this mist pass and you can use this in Photoshop to add a little bit more volumetrics to your scene. But for me in the viewport, it, it's really helpful to just highlight the objects as like black and white elements and just based on, purely on distance to the camera. So I can kind of think very clearly about the foreground. So in the foreground, you can kind of see it's dark black here or the flowers and stuff running up my scene. As you get to the mid ground, you've got some, you know, Monstera plants and some of the chairs and things here kind of framing out there. And in the background, you've got this kind of archway uh, leading out to the background scene. If I kind of go even further out here, you might see those rocks and stuff. So. This is how it's framing out. I really like how that looks in the mist pass. And I can go back over to uh, combined again here and then see everything as it was to begin with. So that's always very helpful. Another thing is using volumetrics to your scene. For this one, I didn't really feel like it was necessary to add it because I actually did quite a bit of work in the world properties with one of my favorite add-ons, which is the physical starlight and atmosphere. I spend so much time, as you will know, if you've ever watched my videos, tweaking the lighting design because I find it to be the most crucial element uh, to any render really. Uh, but if you can ever, if you ever find your render kind of falling flat, focus on the lighting or volumetrics because it really shapes how light is affecting your scene. You know, what objects are highlighted. You kind of have this almost like rim light on the plants here from how I've directed the sunlight. If I click up onto, I can find it. Everything's kind of poorly organized here, sorry. There's my starlight sun. You can see it's coming in this way. So it's hitting kind of the you know outlines of these plants, hitting the frame of this archway here, you know, hitting this kind of top thing here, and it's highlighting those details. I've added a lot of different emission lights here too that are kind of casting some interesting shadows uh, around the structure here. You got some really cool reflections on the floor. You got some lamps and things. So I focused a lot on the volumetric aspects and the lighting aspects of this render too, and that really can give you so much depth because it can add shadows 
to your scene. It can highlight certain things. And, you know, this is something that is going to be very case to case basis. I can't give you just a general like, hey, here's where you should put lighting in your scene. It really depends on your scene to begin with. And, you know, this goes back to just taking time with your renders. You know, if, if you feel stuck, if you feel like you're kind of not seeing the way around it, return back to nature, you know, return back to looking at inspiration to get uh, some ideas for how, you know, painters or how the real world operates and see how lighting is affecting certain things. You know, turn on the lamp in your room and, you know, move it around some of your plants just to see how it would affect the leaves, how things can be kind of lit up certain ways that can give you ideas. I'll often do that too uh, with some of the plants I've got in my space. And then, yeah, just kind of experimenting, moving things around and seeing how things change and adjust. And what I'd like to do, this file is kind of a poor example of my organizational skills here, <laughs> but usually I will organize uh, lights into different collections and I can kind of turn them on or off and see how certain ones are affecting the scene. So I'll kind of group all my point lights or like my lamps and stuff together so I can turn that on and off. I'll kind of have general splash lights. I've got this like point light here that's kind of giving some general, you know, warm lighting to the scene here if I kind of zoom out a bit. Um, that's kind of giving some lighting to this area here and kind of splashing a little bit onto the floor just to brighten that part up because I found it was like a little bit dark. If I turn this off, you can see it just adds like a little bit of light in that area. Same deal with this one. This is kind of just like a general point light. Just kind of adds a little bit more brightness to here because I was noticing that these were kind of getting lost. So these are just things that you, you, you'll you notice as you're working through this. And again, it takes a lot of time, takes a lot of practice. I still feel like I'm learning a lot as I'm working through here. Um, yeah, just a little plug for physical starlight atmosphere too. There are so many different parameters here that you can change. You know, the ones I think I focused on the most for this were the density, kind of changing this fall off of the atmosphere here in the background. Um, the scattering constants here, just to see what the intensity of this, you know, overall atmosphere would be. And then actually, if you go all the way down here, uh, there's this really cool tab, artistic controls, that you can kind of tweak a little bit too. I think I kept these at the default, but sometimes I'll play around with this because you can really have some interesting effect on like kind of like the fall off of the scene. If you look at the sky here, if I turn this fall off like way up, it, it almost looks like you're in outer space, which is kind of cool, kind of the effect I was going for. But I kind of wanted this to be slightly more grounded in real life, so I brought this back to you know just like a normal default thing here. So spend a lot of time with those parameters, really take your time with that. And this brings me to the last tip here, and this really only applies for animations. You know, the way I've been able to do these animations is because I've really thought a lot about the depth of my scene. Obviously for animations, it's very different than a still image because you're actually moving the camera through the scene and you can't really hide things as much. So sometimes I think very one directional. I think of my camera in this fixed position when I'm initially mapping out scenes. You know, and if you were to like look around the corner, or even like look behind the camera, there is nothing here. This is the abyss, you know, same deal off to the side here. There's nothing to the left or to the right. Everything is contained in this middle part, but that is all that matters because I knew when I was designing this that I was only going to be moving the camera either forward or back with a little bit of rotation to it. So if I go over to my camera, I've added just a couple keyframes here and I can show you, you know, this is how it's walking into the frame as if you're kind of like a person walking in. I've got kind of like this little look up to the left here where I've got this staircase that I actually added in later because I liked the detail, kind of like the leading lines to lead you up to the heavens, up to the stars above. I thought that was cool. And then I kind of have this continue to move into the space and then look back over to the right where I filled a lot of detail in here. We've got, like, got these lounge chairs. I made this like little platform leading up to those lounge chairs with like a bunch of plants and rocks and natural elements kind of surrounding it with some lamps and things to throw some light in that corner here. Um, so it looks over there a little bit and then we center the camera back up again and kind of head off onto the distance. Uh, so I, I really thought a lot about that composition uh, when I was mapping things out. You know, everything feels very full, very lush, but also very balanced. It's not overcrowded in places where I don't want it to be. It has just the nice, perfect uh, composition elements here all structured very well. So again, I spent a lot of time thinking about the camera angle and this really only applies for animations, but you know, think about where you're gonna be moving the camera and that is kind of where you can focus detail or not focus detail if you're not looking there. You know, so if I know I'm not looking behind me, I don't need to put stuff there. I don't need to add extra data uh, to Blender to my composition to really bog down the renders, bog down the viewport while you're working. And you know, if you group things better than I did here, you can also turn things off too if stuff is starting to lag a little bit. It, it gets a little bit tough when you're adding animation. This scene, I didn't really add too much animation, but sometimes I'll have water simulation animated or I've got like plant movement going on or I've got other you know, elements in the scene that are animated. And as I'm trying to you know, preview that animation, 
you know, you can see up here the frame rate. It's pretty much real time here as I'm playing back. It's hovering right around 24 frames a second, which is the final render. But sometimes that'll dip down to like one frame per second if the scene is very dense or if there's a lot of different things going on that are kind of slowing stuff down. So turn things off and that gives you just a chance to isolate just the camera, just the composition and really think about the macro elements. You know, always go back to your initial composition, always go back to kind of the base structure of your scene, thinking about how all of those macro pieces work together and then you can start to focus on the details and that's where the lighting can really enhance specific aspects of the scene. But I hope this is helpful for you. I hope you learned some things from these new tips here. This is stuff I think about all the time while I'm working and if I can impart that little bit of wisdom onto you and your own projects, that is phenomenal. I always love seeing what you do, so please tag me in the work that you put out. It's always really exciting to kind of see how you implement a lot of my tips and tricks into your own renders. As always, if you're not subscribed already, please subscribe below for future tutorials and I hope to see you on the next one. Thank you so much.